of our health and care services, as well as society in general, the importance of compassion, the importance of working together in a collaborative, supportive way in teams and groups, as we've done for hundreds of thousands of years. And the importance also of time for stillness and reflection and learning. But I want to begin by going back to January of this year. And at that point, the NHS was arguably facing the greatest challenge it has faced since its inception. We know that NHS staff, 50% more NHS staff report debilitating levels of work stress compared with the general working population as a whole. But in January, levels of stress had reached their highest in terms of the data we've been collecting over the years. So in the 2019 National Staff Survey in England, 44% of nurses reported that they'd been unwell as a result of work stress during the previous year. That was the highest level we ever recorded. It was 51% amongst midwives, Amongst community nurses, district nurses and health visitors, it was around 49% and around 37% amongst doctors. In the General Medical Council National Training Survey in 2019, they used the Copenhagen burnout in, in inventory for the first time. That revealed that getting on for 50% of trainers and doctors in training had symptoms of burnout. And what we also saw was very high levels of vacancies in the NHS around in, in England, around 100,000 vacancies, something in the region of 40,000 nurse vacancies. And that was having a huge impact on the experience of other staff in their day to day working because of the pressures that were on them. The same was true in primary care. For example, there were 6,000 GP vacancies. And also what we were seeing was very high levels of intention to quit or actual turnover. This year, I've had the privilege of leading an inquiry commissioned by the Royal College of Nursing Foundation in collaboration with the King's Fund into the mental health and well-being of nurses and midwives across the United Kingdom. And we discovered that some one in four health visitors and nurses quit the NHS within four years of joining. And we also saw very high levels of intention to quit amongst nurses and GPs. So in the RCN survey in 2020, I think it was around 30, 44% uh, of nurses were saying that they were considering leaving the NHS, many of them because of the way that they felt they had been treated during the pandemic. Over 30% of GPs were planning to quit general practice within the next three to five years, according to the GP Working Life Survey. So all of that data gives us a very clear picture of a, se a sector in a crisis. And then the pandemic struck with the consequent increases in workload for everybody with all of the fear and the anxiety that all of us have experienced over these months, but particularly focused for health and care staff, many of them facing extra fears in terms of their own health and well-being, and many of them, of course, experiencing the tragic loss of colleagues. So I think that it's really important that when we think about our health and care services and we think about the future and what we learned from the pandemic. We, we shift from thinking about reverting to where we were once we've got through the worst of this um, and think about how we transform our health and care services for the long term future, not for the next year or two years, but for the long term future, taking into account the context of where we have been. And the epidemic has had a huge impact on staff. We know that there are, uh, in the studies that have been done already, there are 
really clear indications of a, a worryingly high level of symptoms of PTSD amongst health and care staff. And we've seen over half a million contacts with the uh, COVID-19 web task su staff support website that we set up during this period. So what can we learn from this? And I think the first important lesson is about compassion. Compassion has, I think, enabled us all around the globe to cope to some extent with the, these really challenging times. And in our country, what we've seen is the enormous compassion of health and care staff towards patients and service users. Just before we began the webinar, I was mentioning the staff in the care home where my father-in-law lives, and many of them spending weeks sleeping in the care home, especially during the early part of the epidemic, so they didn't bring the infection in. We've seen enormous compassion from staff towards each other, whether from you know the small gestures of cups of tea or checking in on each other, and through to much greater acts of compassion. And we've seen compassion shown by the community, whether it was the compassion for local community groups or individual neighbours, for elderly people living alone. We've seen extraordinary compassion and innovation, um, suddenly being able to house 15,000 homeless people in the space of a week or two. And the huge support that the community has shown for our health and care services, over a million volunteers to work in the NHS. So I want to explore, first of all, this concept of compassion. Compassion is a, is a word that shimmers, but what does it really mean? For me to show compassion to somebody who's in distress or in pain, I have to certainly show four behaviours. I have to attend, understand, empathise and help. So attending is about being present. It's about giving attention. It's about being present in the here and now with the other. Nancy Klein uses a wonderful phrase, listening with fascination that I think epitomizes that concept of attending and being present. Second, I have to understand the causes of the other's distress or pain, ideally through a di having a dialogue with them rather than me simply imposing my understanding. And compassion thirdly involves, of course, feelings. It involves empathizing feeling or mirroring the other's distress without being overwhelmed by it. And that gives me the motivation for the fourth element of compassion, which is helping or serving the other, helping them to, to alleviate or ameliorate or cope with their distress or pain or fear. Michael, I'm really sorry to interrupt you there. I think there might, might have been a small error because, um, and I didn't want to interrupt the flow, the, the um, slides haven't shared um, with everybody yet. It may be that you're not intending to use slides at this point, but just in case, I wanted to stop you and make sure that we could uh, see the slides if you wanted us to. Uh, apologies. Well, good, good shout, Rebecca. I'll, I'll get to the slides very shortly, um, uh, but thank you for, for uh, thinking of that and interrupting is helpful. Um, so we've come to understand a lot more about compassion as a result of recent neuroscience studies, particularly the distinction between empathy or sympathy alone and compassion. So what we see in neuroscience studies when we ask people to be empathic or sympathetic, but that's associated with the activation of pain centers in the brain. It's understandable because we're mirroring the other's pain. Whereas with compassion, we see the activation of reward centers or pleasure centers in the brain. And again, that makes sense because we're hardwired as a species to be altruistic, to help each other. It's a way, it's one of the ways that we bond, we create a sense of connection, we, we create a sense of group, of group identity or community. But recent research has also helped us to understand much more about the role of compassion in, in healthcare. 
Um, a review by two American medics, Treziak and Mazzarelli, published last year. Pull together all of the information and knowledge we have about the role of compassion in healthcare. And they predominantly they reviewed hundreds of studies. They predominantly included randomized control trials or meta-analyses. And I want to show you just some selected um, examples of the material that they reviewed. <laughs> so I'm just changing the slides. Rebecca, is that, does that change for, for you? Great, thank you. So let's take the first one, it's a randomized control trial, a large randomized control trial of patients um, pre-surgery. And the interventions were either anesthetists visited them prior to surgery to do a normal visit and provide them with sedatives as usual, or they visited and were asked to be simply compassionate rather than providing sedatives. And the observation was that patients in the compassion intervention were calm, calm, but not drowsy, whereas in the normal pre-surgical visit, they were drowsy, but not particularly calm. And those interventions were associated with post-surgery differences. The compassion intervention patients required less uh, painkiller, painkillers, and also had a shorter length of hospital stay. The second example is a large randomized control trial of patients with an early diagnosis of uh, likely terminal lung cancer. It was a study of quality of life and patients were assigned either to normal early cancer care or to early palliative extra compassionate care, if you like. And indeed, the study showed that those in the compassion or palliative, early palliative care condition had a much better quality of life. But what was a surprise to the researchers was the finding that those patients also survived significantly longer. And we see from the research similarly strong effect sizes in relation to clinician compassion in the treatment of long-term conditions like diabetes or HIV. And I should, I should say that all of this, re this review is published in, in the book, which you can see on the slide. I've certainly gone through a lot of the original source material and find the book is faithful to um, the research reports. And a colleague in the Netherlands has gone through all of them and um, confirmed the accuracy of the book in presenting findings. What the research also shows is that um, contrary to what the majority of clinicians, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals believe, that compassion doesn't take any longer in encounters or conflict consultations, but also there's the important finding given what I said at the beginning, that when we ask, for example, general practitioners to be extra compassionate in their interactions, in their consultations over a two week period, for example, what we see is a significant impact on clinician well-being with lower levels of stress, anxiety and depression. And the evidence suggests that compassion is also much more cost effective than not having compassion in uh, clinician interactions with patient service users. And the effect sizes are extraordinarily large, larger than the effects of aspirin in the treatment of heart attacks and of statins in the five year risk of a cardiovascular event. So what this appears to show is the huge significance of compassion in healthcare. And the challenge for us is how we create conditions within our health and care organizations where compassion is a strong value, it's the norm in the way that people interact with patients and also indeed in the way they interact with each other. And the answer to that, that question is, well, it's about the culture of our organizations and of course, every interaction by every one of us every day in our organizations is an opportunity to shape the culture. How warm we are, how kind we are, how irritable we are, how cynical we are, 
how compassionate we are will contribute to the shaping of the culture of our organizations because uh, the processes of emotional contagion um, these things ripple out from our behavior but the role of leaders is of course particularly powerful what leaders pay attention to and focus on and talk about and monitor and reward and what they model in their behavior tells us what it is they value so it's important that leaders integrate these behaviors into their leadership that means leaders listening understanding empathizing and helping and what's fascinating is that if we look at the last 50 60 years of leadership research internationally this huge volume of research we see that these four behaviors are identified again and again as being key to leadership effectiveness it's not that this is some new model of, of leadership we've known for 60 years that these are either the core or among the core behaviors that constitute effective leadership probably the most important skill of a leader is listening to those they lead being present with them attending listening to them with fascination probably the most important task of a leader kind of sounds obvious but the most important task of a leader is helping those they lead to do their jobs effectively to do the jobs they want to do and that's about removing the obstacles that get in the way or ensuring they have the resources they need whether it's the right number of staff the right technologies equipment and the skills and the knowledge and abilities they need to do their jobs effectively and it's not a coincidence that the behaviors that constitute compassion are the behaviors that constitute effective leadership because these are the behaviors that enable us as humans to connect with each other and to feel a sense of connection to feel a sense of belonging to have a sense of bonding so it's no coincidence that these behaviors are similar so it's essential that leaders embody compassionate compassion in their leadership particularly in the context of health and care services where the core value is about compassion and what we also know from research is that it, these behaviors are associated with organizational performance as well so if we look in the private sector retail service sector organizations so the work of people like ben schneider a leading researcher in the states over the three or four decades now has shown the what they call the value link between these leader these leader behaviors staff satisfaction customer service customer satisfaction customer loyalty company productivity and profitability and we also see similar findings in health service settings so as you know we introduced a national staff survey in England back in 2003 that's been run annually for 17 years we have 17 years worth of data and there are over now over half a million responses now every year from staff it's the most extraordinary data set and it's enabled many people to engage in the most sophisticated and um, complex and advanced statistical analysis and has revealed that if we want to predict the performance of an NHS trust over the next two to three years there's no more important data to tell us that than the staff survey data and this is a very crude summary of some of the key findings here showing the links between the staff views of their leaders and patients views of the care they receive we know that when staff report high work pressure and please remember what I said at the beginning of this talk that patients subsequently say they're not treated with they were not treated with compassion they're not shown the respect or the sense of dignity or shown the privacy that they wanted and when staff report high levels of work stress poor health and well-being in those trusts we subsequently see significantly worse care quality lower levels of patient satisfaction worse financial performance 
and in the acute sector, significantly higher levels of patient mortality. So these, these leadership styles and behaviors are critical, not only for individual staff well-being and for reflecting the values that NHS staff bring to their work and, and the core founding values of the NHS, they're also important in terms of organizational performance. And we see similar relationships in the primary care sector as well. But I also want to emphasize that compassionate leadership is not some soft cushions and scented candles approach to leadership. On the contrary, I think compassionate leadership requires real courage and much more courage than what's the rather easy opt-out to command and control leadership. Um, actually listening to staff, seeking to understand their perspective, empathizing with them and seeking to help them um, requires much more courage, I think, than just directing and, uh, and, and perhaps simplifying, but directing and commanding people. And in, in, in compassionate leadership, the compassion is ultimately for, for the people and the communities that we serve in health and care services. So far from being a, a loss of commitment to purpose and performance, compassionate leadership is, is about a really strong focus on purpose and performance and performance management. And it's not about some easy consensus way forward. Nelson Mandela, I think one of the greatest leaders of the last century, when he was released from 27 years of imprisonment in Robben Island, went against the hundreds of thousands and vast majority of millions of his followers in refusing to lead them to the war against the apartheid regime. He went against his followers and insisted on seeking a negotiated way forward. And against all of the odds, I think out of his greater compassion for his society as a whole, against all of the odds achieved a relatively peaceful transition to a biracial South Africa. And compassionate leadership is not just about what individuals do, it's about collective leadership. It's about developing collective approaches to leadership based on those key behaviors and those key values. And it's about institutional uh, compassion as well. So it's about organizations at national level, like NHS Improvement, NHS England, embodying compassion in how they behave as organizations in the wider system attending, listening with fascination, understanding, empathizing, and then seeking to help. Because if we're to create cultures of compassion, then those values have to be prominent at every level of the system. And with the People Plan published this year, there is a commitment to creating compassionate and inclusive leadership at every level. Indeed, NHS EI is committing to transforming its culture too. So compassionate leadership is not some easy option. Um, compassionate leadership is about those four behaviors, but it's also about, of course, being effective as a leader because the compassion we're here to deliver for the communities we serve, high quality, continually improving and compassionate care. And effective leadership is about leadership that creates clear direction, high quality, continually improving compassionate care, that creates alignment of people's efforts around that direction. So people's efforts being focused on that direction rather than being dissipated on unnecessary activities, unnecessary bureaucracy. And it's about creating commitment, leadership creating commitment through building trust and motivation amongst staff. And if leadership is not inclusive, then it's not compassionate. And one of the stark lessons from this epidemic has how it's shone a light on the impact of discrimination in our society generally upon health and health inequalities. And in particular, the tragically disproportionate impact of the epidemic upon people from minority ethnic groups. And I detect across the NHS now a sense that 
now is the moment when we must address the issues of discrimination and racism in our health and care system as a model for the whole of society. So it's a, it's, I think it's about seizing this moment now to make those, to achieve those transformations in cultures, in leadership and individual behavior throughout our systems that make them inclusive. And leadership, compassionate leadership is also about collective leadership. It's not about hoarding power and aggrandizing power for our own um, benefit. It's about, it's about ensuring everybody feels they have leadership responsibility and accountability. It's one of the, I think, real paradoxes of our healthcare system, that it's probably has the largest, most skilled and motivated workforce in the whole of industry. Yet they're managed largely through extended hierarchies and command and control. It just makes no sense. And we know that quality and safety are best protected when quality and safety is everybody's business. And that means ensuring everybody feels that they have accountability and leadership responsibility. The domestic worker who wants to raise a hygiene issue, her or his voice should be as loud as any other voice in the organization. And we see good examples of where this ha is happening across the system. And it's also about compassionate leadership across boundaries of leaders prioritizing care overall, not just our own areas of responsibility, of being compassionate in the way we work with other teams, with other departments, with other organizations and with other sectors. And we've seen some great examples of that during these last 10 months. The last point I want to make about compassionate leadership is is a really important point for me. I've had the privilege over the last three years, first of chairing, co-chairing uh, an inquiry on behalf of the General Medical Council into the mental health and well-being of doctors, and then this year chairing an inquiry on behalf of the Royal College of Nursing Foundation into the mental health and well-being of nurses. And we used as a guiding model for that work a model of the core needs of people at work, uh, which we've called the ABC of core needs. It's um, a model developed by DC and Lyon in the States called self-determination theory. But the point of this is that first, if we're to be compassionate as leaders, if we're to be effective as leaders in any way, we have to understand what the core needs of people are at work. That makes sense. But also that actually, if we want to deal with some of the problems I described at the beginning, levels of stress and vacancies and intention to quit, we have to make sure we're meeting people's core needs at work. So the three core needs that the model identifies, we identifies, we've called them the ABC of core needs, are the needs we all have at work for autonomy or control that we we must feel we have voice and influence rather than being coerced, directed. We have need to have a sense of belonging, that we are working in teams and groups where we feel cared for and where we care for those we work with, where we work in organizations where we feel valued and respected and supported. And third, that we have a sense of contribution or competence, as we called it in the, in the doctor's uh, study the sense that we're making a difference, that we're being effective in our work, uh, and that we're, in the case of healthcare, delivering high quality care that we feel we should be delivering for those we serve. And when these three needs, when all three of these needs have to be met for people to be well and to thrive and to have high levels of intrinsic motivation at work, when they're not being met, that's when people become stressed, when they become disenchanted, disengaged, when they are more likely to quit. And what we, what we saw in our conversations and our gathering of data from nurses and doctors was that very often people didn't feel they had voice and influence. They felt that often they were working in situations which were incredibly pressured, where they didn't have the resources they need 
and they were really afraid of making a mistake and of them being blamed and pilloried and disciplined. And, and where there was, of course, experiences of discrimination and favoritism, certainly we've got very clear evidence of discrimination against minority ethnic groups as well as against others. And the problems of just basic work conditions, places to rest when you're on three 12 hour night shifts or access to nutritious food or all of the problems with parking, for example, on night shifts or work schedules and rotors that were simply inflexible, that took no account of people's home and work life needs. And also the importance of a sense of belonging that many staff, doctors, for example, junior doctors particularly, not being part of stable teams. And yet the evidence we have is that working in a relatively stable team, of course we work in many teams in healthcare, but having a stable, what we would call a home team to come back to, where you get your social support and your learning, maybe engaging in quality improvement projects, that membership of a home team is associated with profoundly positive effects on, on well-being at work. In fact, the evidence you've gathered shows that People who work in uh, have those home teams are dramatically less likely to have uh, to be ill as a result of stress at work or to be intending to quit or actually quitting. Um, and and it's about how working in environments where uh, people feel valued and respected and supported. And the third area is the importance of that sense of competence. And the key factor here is chronic excessive workload that healthcare staff and social care staff are working in conditions where they have chronic work overload and that is the number one predictor of staff stress it also happens to be the number one predictor of staff intention to quit and it's the uh, has the highest uh, negative correlation with subsequent patient satisfaction chronic we know that stress in healthcare services is generally chronic rather than episodic or transient. And chronic stress is what damages human health, as you know. It's associated with cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disorders, addictions, cancers, diabetes, and depression. It's also chronic stress and chronic work overload is associated with um, errors in healthcare treatment. Um, when, when doctors report high levels of stress, they are between, this is a study from the Cleveland Clinic, uh, replicates many others, they're between 45 and 63 percent more likely to make a major medical error in the subsequent month. And we know that there are similar associations amongst other professional groups in healthcare. And chronic excessive workload has become, I think, rather like the pattern on the wallpaper that we no longer see in healthcare. And if we're not addressing it, then we're not addressing what I think is a major uh, problem in, in our entire sector. And it's about people having supportive supervision and opportunities for growth and development. Now, what's, what's really, I think, encouraging and it's inspiring from the work that I've had, a, had the privilege to be involved with over these last three years is the, the many examples in organizations where these issues have been identif uh, identified and dealt with effectively. So we see in Nottingham uh, University hospitals, their system of staff governance, there's something like 80 to 90 nursing councils that meet regularly. They have protected time to raise and talk about and deal with issues. And we see similar examples in places like Gloucestershire. Um, Mersey Care, huge trust has introduced a restorative culture, moving away from fear and blame to justice and fairness. And they've reduced suspensions by, I think, over 80% um, and disciplinaries by over 70%, saving themselves millions of pounds in the process. Um, North East London Foundation Trust doing amazing work in transforming cultures of discrimination into cultures of fairness and inclusion and equity and uh, positive approaches to diversity. And lots of good examples around just changing basic work conditions in Northern Ireland. They've provided free parking overnight for all staff during the epidemic. And there's lots of examples of places that have um, improved 
rest conditions um, and uh, provided free food, for example, on night, on night shifts. Um, and working schedules and rotors, there's good work now, now going on addressing some of the issues around that. Um, Betsy Kawada in Wales with their EU Austrian system is one example, but there are many. Um, I think one of the issues that needs to be addressed is the 12 hour shifts that nurses um, do. Of course, there are many reasons why nurses like 12 hour shifts, but we know that they are damaging to nurse wellbeing and potentially to safety. And it's also about building team working in secondary care and primary care and, and again, many, many good examples of where this is being done. Northern Ireland has adapted the Birtzog model from the Netherlands with their district nursing teams to build more effective teamwork and more local ownership and uh, flatten hierarchies. In Wales, um, in terms of culture and leadership, they have adopted nationally a 10 year strategy for developing compassionate and collective and inclusive leadership across the entire system. And I think that vision of a 10 year strategy is absolutely right, not some short term fix. And the people plan, of course, is emphasizing compassionate and inclusive leadership. And in Northern Ireland, they've been implementing a collective and compassionate leadership strategy across the system for two years now. And similarly, in Scotland, the whole of Scottish government has Project LIFT, which is its leadership strategy focused on collective and compassionate leadership. But let me talk a little bit about where things are, where workload is being addressed. Of course, the, the principal issue in relation to workload is having an adequate staffing. And I have to say, if my, I have a, I, I welcome certainly the people plan. I think it's, it says all of the right things. And I know that senior people associated with the, with the uh, people plan are um, undertaking Herculean, Herculean efforts to make sure that it is implemented over the coming years. But we must also have a workforce strategy. And as the Health Foundation in its report published yesterday emphasized, that's about looking across the next 10 years of, of what workforce we're going to need with what skills in what roles and how we're going to meet those staffing needs. And that has to be done, I think, at local level at every within every local organization too. And looking at the whole of health and social care as well about ensuring we have the workforce we need and that we retain them. You know, the, the extraordinary finding that I may have mentioned earlier that one in four nurses and health visitors leave within three or four years of joining the NHS tells us the bucket has gaping holes in it and we can pour, we can continue to pour people into it, but we have to get these basic work needs met. East London Foundation Trust um, has addressed the issue of workload. They ask their staff regularly what work they would stop doing or get rid of or reduce, and they've reduced, um, they've eliminated 85% of clinical audit activities in the context of having a, a really effective quality improvement culture. They're rated outstanding by CQC. And they asked their staff what rules they would get rid of. Incidentally, they discovered that a third of them weren't rules um, at all. But there's also, we've seen you know, how the development of multi-professional team working before and during the epidemic helps teams address workload issues. We've seen the use of technology for reducing workload in the epidemic and prior to that too. But we also have to move clearly to new ways of working with communities where communities have genuine co-ownership and co-design of health services and care services and their delivery. We've got great examples from places like Bromley and Bow or the Well Together Initiative in London or further afield in places like um, the Nuka system in Alaska or Montefiore system in New York or the Christchurch New Zealand um, uh, engagement of communities in the delivery of care. And that has to be the way of the future, I think. And great examples, Manchester University Foundation Trust with its system of uh, supervision and support uh, and so on. So I think, I mean, if you look at the reports we produced, this one was for nursing, this is the doctor's report we produced, we produced you'll see great examples of, um, of 
of, of how these issues and these work needs are being met by organizations. So it's critical that, that we, we see work needs, addressing work needs is core to dealing with workforce issues. So compassion, team working I've emphasized. And the third is the importance of stillness and reflection. I've had the privilege this year of having a garden in my house and particularly during those really anxious weeks and months, being able to spend time out there watching the insects, listening to the birds, having that sense of connection with nature and stillness. I practice meditation every day. And that time of stillness for all of us is so reinforcing and nourishing. But we've also discovered that it's really important for teams and organizations. We started looking at healthcare teams under pressure back in the early 1990s. And what happens if they take time out on a regular basis, whether it's a ward shift at the beginning of the shift, um, ward rounds, or whether it's a ward shift of nurses doing a debrief at the end of the shift, or breast cancer care teams with regular reviews, or community mental health teams, or primary health care teams. At one of them, the Jubilee Practice in Leicester, told us that they were under enormous pressure and they made the counterintuitive decision two years ago to introduce two practice meetings for an hour each a week and a partners meeting to which everyone could which everyone could attend. And they found that they were able to innovate, work smarter, reduce everybody's workload and increase patient satisfaction. The general finding that we have is that teams that take time out on a regular basis are much more productive and innovative um, than teams that don't. And there's this pathology, not just in health and care organizations, but in organizations generally, I think, that reifies overwork and chronic over excessive workload. Um, but in fact, it's counterproductive. The Macy, sorry, the Tannenbaum and Carasoli meta-analysis of 49 published peer-reviewed studies shows that debriefs, um, if you look at just the data on teams in their meta-analysis, that those that do debriefs and have after action reviews and take time out on a regular basis are between 35 and 40 percent more productive than teams that don't. It's a deep lesson about the importance of reflection and stillness. And we have data at organization level that tells the same story. So to summarize, these are the, I guess, key points. It's about how we create psychological safety for those in our health and care organizations, for patients, for staff, service users, carers, and that's about compassionate leadership and effective team working. But we also need clear direction, cultures of reflection and learning rather than fear and blame, where we have frequent positive contact with those we lead and our, con our colleagues, where we also value difference and diversity and manage conflict positively and effectively, and where we create climates of mutual support and compassion and where there's leadership and humility. I'm not going to dwell on the next slide. I just want to show you um, uh, we've been developing a culture change program, Kings Fund, NHS Improvement Centre for Creative Leadership for the last five years. And the links are at the bottom that will give you access to a huge wealth of evidence-based open source tools for how we achieve these kinds of cultures. And at the bottom also is the, the NHS Wales website on developing compassionate and collective leadership called Gwetla. Again, all open source evidence-based materials. But I want to finish by emphasizing that I think the first step for all leaders and actually all of us working in these sectors, in fact, in life, is to have the courage to be self-compassionate if we're to make a difference. To have the courage to be self-compassionate. And what that means in practice is to have the courage to be self-aware in the moment rather than spending the vast proportion of our time being anxious about what's coming next or ruminating about the past to be self-aware in the moment but that, that in it then enables us to appreciate understand the challenges we face in our work and in our lives generally and then to take have the courage to take the step to be empathic caring towards ourselves. We're as deserving of compassion and care and love as any other human being on the planet. And in 
turning that compassion, that caring upon ourselves, it gives us the motivation to take intelligent action to help ourselves so that we can be the best we can be and live our lives in fulfilling ways and stay close to the core values that give us our lives meaning. And, and that then enables us when we're deeply connected with ourselves to have deeper and more authentic connections with indeed all of those we work with or indeed all of those we interact with. So it begins, I think, with having the courage of self-compassion. So thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Michael. Um, that felt like a very um, compassionate talk, actually, um, and uh, I've really um, enjoyed it. It spoke to a lot of the work we're doing. It resonated with many things we're thinking about, but added and, and made a contribution to our thinking in this area. So really appreciate a, a, a fantastic talk. I could talk to you for about three or four hours now, but that would be selfish. So um, I'm going to ask some of the questions that have popped up in the chat. Please, if you have any questions, um, add them in there. But we do only have um, about seven or eight minutes. So <clears throat> I'll try and make this quick and um, get through as many of these as we can. So um, your point about stillness and reflection, Michael, has, has resonated with people and people have said that they agree with that idea, <clears throat> but it might be quite a difficult um, idea to promote. Um, have you found that it's easy to pr promote the idea of, of stillness and reflection as an intervention? And how would you go about arguing that within, within an organisation? Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. And let me just say, my email address is at the, on the last slide. And if anyone, anyone wants to follow up with a question by email, given the time limitations, then I would be delighted. Please do. So how to promote having times of reflection and debriefs and after action reviews and so on in organizations? Well, firstly, I think people intuitively recognize that this is right. Um, the, the problem is how we how we change the culture. I was talking to somebody from the military um, a couple of weeks ago who was part of the recovery commission, um, the COVID recovery commission, and he was saying that in combat situations, they've discovered that having two ward rounds a day and one consultant meeting a day is absolutely essential to their ability to function effectively under the most stressful possible conditions. So if they can do it, anybody can do it. Um, and second, I think it's really important that the arguments that we present are, I think, enabled by first evidence and second case studies. So the evidence is so overwhelmingly convincing that meta-analysis by Tannenbaum and Carasoli showing a 35 to 40% increase in productivity associated with um, debriefs is is very compelling evidence, but also the many case studies that we have of where this is happening. I mentioned the Jubilee practice in Leicester. That's one of so many that we encounter or A&E units in South Wales that have instigated these um, reflection times. And wherever we look, this practice exists, we see the benefits. So I think it's about persistently dripping out the messages and the evidence of, of the case examples to um, to bring about change. It's essential, not only for productivity, but also for innovation, smarter working, and also for the mental health and wellbeing of staff. Thank you, Michael. You clearly work very closely with healthcare organisations. Um, we, we can feel that you're not somebody who sits in your ivory tower and does this work remotely, that you, you that you engage and you, and you really know about what's going on in organisations. And one of these questions, I think, speaks to that. How has the concept of compassionate leadership been received by higher trust managers? And do you think the targets get in the way of quality human interaction? So I think that, uh, you know, I remember back, I think it was around 2015 and I had, um, I was invited, there was an event happening in London. It was the executive teams of all of the national NHS bodies in England were being brought together for the first time. They were about, there were going to be about 100 people in the room. They were all like me, um, somewhat older, middle-aged or older white men. Not all of them, but most of them. And uh, I'm, 
I had about 15 minutes, I think, to speak with them. And I made the decision at the time to talk with them about compassion, compassion and compassionate leadership, which um, felt like a big risk, but felt like the right thing to do. And I was astonished at the, recept the receptivity um, of people. And I've been astonished over the subsequent years at how compassion as a concept resonates with people, the evidence resonates. And there, I think um, I, either people don't want to object publicly or they recognize it intuitively. And there's, a, there's almost a sense of relief that I get from, from um, talking about compassion in healthcare organizations. Uh, now is the moment, I think, there's a wave. And the fact that the four nations and the four national systems have all committed to compassionate leadership as the core, I think, is hugely encouraging. Yes, I think an overemphasis on targets gets in the way that um, we know that in those trusts where um, boards are more focused on the regulators and financial targets, et cetera, than they are on the conversations about high quality compassionate care, those are the trusts that have subsequently lower quality, uh, poorer performance, poorer financial performance. It's the trusts that have a strong vision about what they're seeking to do in relation to supporting their communities and delivering high quality care, and that are focused on that vision and supporting their staff to achieve that vision. In our work across um, the, the English NHS, we found those that were the trusts that were high performing. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that, you know, when we become mechanistic and transactional in the way that we manage our organizations, we lose sight that culture is the most important factor and that compassion is the key value in the cultures that we need. Thank you. That really great answer to the question. And I think you've probably answered a couple of other questions in the chat as well. But there's one here that struck me as interesting, and that's about the environment. We wouldn't necessarily think of the physical environment being associated with kind of compassionate leadership and some of the concepts you've been talking about. But clearly, as you mentioned, having a garden space, a nice social area, um, some spaces for staff to go to. We've heard about wobble rooms, for example, during the uh, the last few months being made available to staff. The environment seems like it could be really critically important um, to producing uh, the kinds of um, uh, 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 relationships, time and stillness spaces for people. Have you seen trusts that have focused it on improving their environment for compassionate leadership? Um, yeah. Kind of lots, really. Um, you know, places like Sheffield Children's Hospital with its rooftop garden, and many many places have have produced those kind of spaces. Royal Bournemouth and Christchurch Hospital now has a lake in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the trust, and uh, many trusts are, as you say, c creating these wobble rooms. I, I think it may have been Lancashire, one in Lancashire that first initiated the idea. I may have that wrong. Forgive me, but the. Um, the sense that we need to create the right spaces. I, you know, one of the really, what was really painful doing these, undertaking these two reviews was the stories we heard from staff where they didn't have the spaces that they need. I remember talking with junior doctors um, who, you know, were on three 12 hour night shifts and they had a restroom to go to, but it's a room where there were broken chairs and there were three or four computers that people had to use. Um, you know, when people were trying to take rest in there, there was a kind of one dirty duvet. Um, you could rent duvets if you wanted them, but it was so noisy in there. And many of the chairs were broken and, and it just communicates a sense of not being valued or supported or respected. And, and so it makes a huge difference, I think, when people feel that those basic conditions are being put in place. And also that we're taking account of evidence and understanding about the role of nature and greenery. We know, for example, that when people um, can see, patients can see trees and green outside of their windows that, you know, astonishingly they recover faster. So our, our connection with our environment, I think is fundamental. And I think that the lessons of compassion go even deeper in a way, that what compassion is about is about connection and connection is core to what it is to be human. And we have to come to understand that we are connected with each other. Uh, we're connected with our communities. And that sense of connection and support is what's enabled us to cope. And the more we build that sense of connection, I, I think it's really important we build the sense of connection 
with the wider environment, with the, the ecology of which we're a part, and that we build a sense of connection with the entire planet. We're not separate, we're intrinsic to it. And unless we build that wider sense of compassion to our environment, I think we, well, we have to build that wider, that greater sense of compassion with our, our environment. And that's how we'll be able to deal with this even greater challenge in the epidemic of climate change. So I think these issues are fundamentally central. Thank you, Michael, so much. Well, there are other questions in the chat, but it's a couple of minutes over the time. So I'm going to uh, finish, uh, chair the meeting and finish uh, as close to time as, as we can. I'm sure we've all um, learned something today, Michael. There's something that every one of us will be taking away from your talk and hopefully improving our lives and those around us. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.